Betty Deathway here. Uh, sorry for dropping off the radar for a few weeks from my channel. Um, at the very last minute, the website I translate on, ushaworld.com, uh, got a chance to exhibit at San Diego Comic Con. And I was pretty much in charge of organizing it, and then I had to fly out from China to San Diego to uh, be there, and then I had to fly back, and it was just kind of a crazy few weeks. But I'm back. As you can see, if you looked at the title screen, I'm starting a new little mini series of videos on the channel in which I'm going to be reviewing either um, Chinese fantasy martial arts novels or novels that are related to that genre and maybe some stuff relating to Chinese culture. So the first novel that I'm going to be reviewing is uh, this novel right here. It's called Udang or Udang, depending on how you want to pronounce it, Fist of the Wanderer. It's by Barbara Doran. Check it out on Amazon.com. Uh, Barbara and I don't really know each other per se, but we follow each other on Twitter and have interacted a little bit. And I've been wanting to read some of her stuff for quite a while, so I picked it up when I was in America. And so the way I'm going to do these reviews, starting with this one, is I will uh, start out with a really brief overview of what the book's like, and then I'll go into some of the pros and cons uh, from my perspective. So this book, uh, Udang Fist of the Wanderer, is a Mm, more modern kind of martial arts uh, novel. It takes place during the end of the Qing Dynasty period, sort of roughly around the Gold Rush period in America. And the main character of the story is a martial artist. And turns out, uh, you find out later in the story that he's actually like a top master martial artist who eventually retired from the martial arts world and joined a Taoist sect and studied Taoism and sort of renounced his violent ways. Anyway, he gets involved in a plot that takes him from Shanghai all the way to San Diego and then up the coast to San Francisco. And uh, it's uh, this is published by Airship 27, which if you see right here, it says pulp for a new generation. So it's, in it's intended to be pulp fiction. It's not supposed to be like historically accurate, I don't think. Uh, and it's a really fun story. As you can see, it's, it's very short. It's only um, five chapters long. For the price, it's a little bit expensive, um, so if you're a starving college student, I wouldn't put it on your list, but if you are interested in the genre and would like to support original content creators who have good, solid writing and make good stories, then I would definitely uh, check it out. And she has a few other books as well that you can find by clicking through her author page on Amazon.com. So let me get into some of the positives and negatives as I saw them. First positive was the main character himself. I really liked him. He is that sort of like um, happy-go-lucky, sort of like friendly, laughing uh, character who's always always has a good attitude. But he, you can tell that he has a little bit of darkness somewhere in his past that the story never gets too deeply into. Uh, he's also, you know, like I said, top martial artist, really um, good fighter, and he sort of like makes the story, in my opinion. Um, there are a lot of other characters who are you know, either evil or like um, motivated by selfishness or motivated by their desire to be the top martial artist. And he is kind of just like floating through the world trying to make the best of things according to his philosophy. And I really liked him. I also liked how there is a martial world or a Jiang Hu. One of the cool things about uh, the narrative is it actually gets into the meaning of the name Jiang Hu. So you'll sometimes see it translated in certain other works as the world of rivers and lakes, because literally it means river and lake, those two characters, Jiang and Hu. Uh, the story kind of gets into that, and I like the fact that it actually just exists within the world of the story. Um, another pro is that it's a sort of like um, Western-Eastern mix. If you've ever seen the movie, I can't, I'm pretty sure it's called High Noon with uh, Jackie Chan and Owen Wilson, it's a very similar thing where you have a Chinese martial artist involved in the Wild West of the United States. I really like that and I really like how it mixes the um, martial arts world with that other world of the Wild West. It's very cool. Um, there are a lot of cultural references in the story um, that are, you know, accurate and so that makes it cool to sort of like um, make it feel realistic and you can even maybe learn a little bit about Chinese culture. Um, I do have some, some of the negatives um, that have to do with Chinese culture. I'll get that, to that in a second. There is some cool language stuff. So the people in the story, uh, some of the characters speak Chinese and not English. Some of them speak uh, English and not Chinese, and there's different mixtures of those. And so I really like how those situations are portrayed. As a language student myself, that kind of stuff really fascinates me. And I think for most of us who are interested in 
Chinese culture and literature. It's, it's, a, it's cool. One, uh, for instance, um, there's one part of the story that talks about uh, the, the word Tao. So the Tao uh, from Taoism, the great Tao, uh, Tao can mean the way or the path or the road or something like that. Um, it's actually pronounced almost exactly the same as the word for a Chinese saber. So a saber is a Tao, and the Tao, the Tao from Taoism is the Tao. So in Chinese, it's Tao and Tao. Um, they are pronounced differently in the tone. Uh, and there's some cool wordplay in the story about that. I really like that. It's explained well. Uh, one of the books that I translated, my main first main project, um, actually had similar wordplay in one of the parts of the story. So I thought that was really cool. Another interesting thing is, uh, another, another definite positive is that there are illustrations throughout the story. So uh, black and white sort of like Pulp Fiction comic book style uh, illustrations. And um, I think that, that I mean, I, I was, um, I've always been a fan of that kind of stuff. Uh, especially like the Frank Frazetta drawings from things like uh, the Barsoom series. I really think that's cool. I think it makes a story. So those are some of the pros. Um, let me get into some of the cons. So. I mentioned that there's some in the prose section that uh, the Chinese culture stuff was cool. There were some things that stuck out to me as being jarring or incorrect. Um, so again, this again, a this is supposed to be pulp fiction. It's supposed to be fun. It's not a historical novel. So this kind of stuff isn't that important. And also, for most people who are not students of Chinese culture and language, probably it would go over the heads of most people. Uh, but for me you know, kind of like is the opposite because I'm so focused on that and have been studying it so intensively for so many years. So for example, uh, one thing had to do with the names. Uh, some of the names are written out in the standard pinyin form that is sort of the way that modern Chinese is um, Romanized. But then some of the names were, uh, some of the names use the old uh, Wade Gal system of spelling. For any of you who are students of Chinese, you know what I'm talking about. It just kind of was incongruous uh, because there didn't seem to be any specific reason for that. It was never addressed. Um, and since they're all Chinese people with Chinese names, to me it would make more sense to have them all um, be standardized in the way that they are uh, Romanized in the story. Another big cultural thing that really jumped out to me, and I, again, maybe I was misreading this or I didn't read closely enough. I, I read this on the plane flight back from America to China and it was a long flight and I was kind of tired. So maybe I missed the explanation for this. but. Um, the story portrayed um, Chinese hairstyles in a way that didn't make sense to me. Well, let me explain. So if you've ever seen Kung Fu movies or any kind of historical dramas, you, you'll see the ones that take place in the Qing Dynasty period, um, the men have the front half of their head shaved and the back is in a, a long braid or a queue. And in the story, it seemed to imply that uh, only people of the Manchu background or heritage would have their hair done like that. Now, historically, what happened was the Manchu people basically took over China. They founded the Qing Dynasty. Qing, Qing Dynasty was not a Han Chinese dynasty. It was um, foreigners, basically, um, within China, foreigners. Um, and so one of the very first things, in, one of the very first rules they instituted was that hair thing, that the men had to shave the front of their head and have the back in a queue. And that was basically a way of controlling the populace and asserting their authority. And so basically all Chinese people have their hair like that, all Chinese men have their hair like that with the exception of Taoists or Buddhists. Now it mentions the Taoists and Buddhists thing in the story, but then it seems to imply that people would be able to identify the main character as having a Manchu background because of his hair being done that way. But to me that doesn't make sense because literally all males that were not Taoists, Taoist priests or Buddhist monks would have their hair done that way. And so there would be no way for someone to just look at another person and say, oh, you're a Manchu um, heritage, your bloodline is Manchu because your hair is done like that. It doesn't really make sense to me. Um, so again, maybe I misunderstood something, but that kind of jumped out to me. There were a few language things that, um, you know, as a language student, I'm like super focused on those kind of things. And there were a few things that jumped out to me as, as either mistakes or unrealistic. For example, one thing was that it... it uh, referred to Manchurian and Mongolian as being Chinese dialects, and they're not Chinese dialects, they're separate languages. They're not part of the main Chinese language group. Um, closer to Chinese and English, obviously, but they're definitely not dialects. They have their own um, alphabet, they have their own writing system, and they're pronounced totally differently, so I felt like that was incorrect. Another part that jumped out to me as odd was there was a scene where there are some people, uh, I'm pretty sure it was in a forested area, and there were some people off in the distance speaking Hunanese, the Hunan dialect of, of China. It's the same dialect that uh, Chairman Mao spoke. 
and they're off in the distance kind of yelling. And then the main character, and I think he's with some other Chinese characters, are uh, Chinese people, characters in the story. I, they're able to hear those people shouting and can understand them. I feel like that like it really jumped out to me as being unrealistic because the Hunan dialect is like crazy. If you ever if you are a student of Chinese and you can listen to some videos of it, like even videos of Chairman Mao uh, speaking Hunan dialect, it's like almost impossible to understand. I, I remember one time playing one of the videos for my wife. My wife is Chinese, um, grew up in China, you know, and and I was like, can you understand what she, what he's saying? And if she listened very carefully, she could understand what Chairman Mao was saying, most of what he was saying. But again, that was like a speech with extended dialogue. So I feel like people yelling off in the distance, it would be really hard to understand what they're saying. But again, it, I guess it would depend on what they were saying and a lot of other details. I know I'm nitpicking here. A final thing that I wanted to talk about some of the sort of plot things that jumped out to me. Uh, there were a few things that seemed like super unrealistic. Again, I, know, I understand this is, it's, it's pulp fiction. It's just supposed to be fun and, you know, an adventure and action and things like that. So it's not supposed to be Game of Thrones or something. But there were a couple, I think at least two scenes in which the heroes encountered some villains and the villains had just like within the past day or hours or something, had literally murdered everybody in like in a town or a building or I forget what it was. And like the heroes like saw the bodies or maybe I forget if the heroes saw the bodies or if it was revealed to us in the narrative. Point was these are like bad guys who are, who are not, have no compunctions about murdering people. And yet, when the heroes stumble into them, the bad guys, like, capture them and uh, don't kill them and throw them in a back room and then they can escape and, like, come back to defeat the bad guys. Uh, that kind of thing. So, to me, and again, I do have to point out, this was on a really long, uh, you know, red-eye plane flight, so maybe I kind of dozed off at the wrong spot and then woke back up and misread it or something. But to me, it just seemed kind of a little, like, weird that these evil, murderous bad guys just so happened to, like, tie up the heroes and put them in a closet or something. Uh, maybe that's maybe that's a throwback to, you know, old 50s plot, uh, pulp um, novels and that kind of movies and stuff. I don't know. Maybe it was intentional. Um, finally, the one thing that, and I, I don't want to get into too, too deep of an analysis or to any spoilers, but there was no, for me, there was no main driving, like, strong plot going from beginning to end. There is a reason for the main character to, to leave China and go to um, California, but it, it to me it like wasn't a, it wasn't like a MacGuffin, you know what I mean? It wasn't something that I, I like I was personally invested in and interested in finding out what happened in the end. It was more like there was a, a motivating factor that kind of pushed him out of China and then it's like kind of he goes from one random incident to another and kind of does this one thing and another thing. Um, so that was in my mind a little bit of a weakness. Um, so that's my overall assessment of uh, Wudang Fist of the Wanderer by Barbara Dorn. I definitely recommend you check out if you're a fan of the genre because there really should be more people that are interested in uh, telling stories about um, uh, Chinese martial arts uh, and writing them well in English. I think it's really important that there be more of that kind of stuff. So definitely check it out. I recommend it. And uh, for those of you who have watched my videos before, I've been working on a catchphrase and I went through a lot of things. I was thinking of or some kind of cool sort of like um, English translation of something from Chinese and then I was thinking of doing some Chinese things. I, am, I ended up deciding that I'm going to go with the Chinese thing. And the, the thing that I'm going to end my videos from now on with is Gao Tzu um, Gao Tzu is um, something you'll hear in a lot of martial arts um, TV shows. I have seen it a few times in the um, Xianxia Chinese fantasy novels that I translate. So Gao Tzu is basically a way to say farewell. And it's not very common nowadays Like people don't say it to each other in daily life. I've never even heard anybody say it. I think you might hear it like in formal situations, maybe um, perhaps like, um, you know, like in meetings or something. I, I don't know. Again, I've, n I've literally never heard anybody say it outside of TV shows. So, I, so it's the kind of thing where um, I, to me, it feels like this sort of like ancient um, old way that the heroes will always say goodbye to each other. That's how they always say in the Wusha so in the Wusha in the Wusha shows. So that's what I'm gonna say goodbye with from now on and you can also use that to learn a little bit of Chinese, although not very practical Chinese because again nobody says it. But uh, uh, one quick last thing is I'm actually gonna be traveling again next week for some personal reasons with my family. Um, not vacation but other personal stuff. Uh, after I get back from that, I should have a lot more content. I have a whole list of things that I'm going to be going over for both Chinese fantasy novels, 
uh, Chinese culture, and I also have already a few books lined up that I've read that I want to review and go into. So that's it for this video. I'll see you in the next video. Godzilla.